Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This is PA Books, featuring authors of books about Pennsylvania's people, politics, history, business, and recreation. This week, author Ken Emerson discusses his book, Duda, the story of Pittsburgh resident Stephen Foster and the rise of American popular culture. Ken Emerson, author of Duda, Stephen Foster and the Rise of American Popular Culture. Why would we be featuring Stephen Foster on a book show dedicated to books about Pennsylvania? Well, Stephen Foster is famous now for having written uh, way down upon the Swanee River Old Books at Home, which is the state song of Florida, and of course my old Kentucky home, which is the state song of Kentucky, sung at the Kentucky Derby every year. But few people realize that where he really spent most of his life was in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, he never wrote a song about Pennsylvania, but uh, he and his family are Pennsylvanians uh, through and through. He grew up in Lawrenceville, which at that point was a suburb of, uh, Pens of, of Pittsburgh, and uh, his family was involved throughout the state. His mother was raised partly in Philadelphia. His parents got married in Chambersburg. Uh, when uh, he divorced his wife, his wife and daughter went to live in Lewistown. Uh, Stephen's half-brother helped build the canal, build the railroad across Pennsylvania, and Stephen's father was involved in the canal across the state. So really, they're a Pennsylvania family through and through. Why isn't he associated with Pennsylvania? I mean, why, why his fascination with the South? Yeah. Well, he wrote, uh, at the time, a blackface minstrel music using the South as sort of a fantasy land. It's not really that far removed from the way that the South, and especially black life, have often in popular culture uh, served this sort of fantastical purpose. When you think of Creedence Clearwater Revival, for instance, four white boys from El Cerrito, California, and certainly never went rolling down the river on Proud Mary. And yet, uh, th th this kind of fantasy is part of American culture, and especially of popular music. Also, he was writing songs of escapism, in a way. Escapism from the Industrial Revolution, and in some many ways, growing up as he did in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s before the Civil War, Pittsburgh was one of the cradles of, uh, of the Industrial Revolution. As a matter of fact, Andrew Carnegie uh, lived just a few blocks down the street. But his, his music was, uh, was escape from that. And, and, and in this, again, as much popular music is, after all, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys wrote all the surf songs and never went surfing. So in the same respect, here he was in Pittsburgh, but he was writing songs about, uh, uh, fantasy songs about life on the plantation and life in the South. You write a lot about minstrel music and minstrel shows in your book. Exactly what is a minstrel show? Um, it's probably only, it's amazing to think that how important a part of our culture uh, and an embarrassing a part of our culture also, minstrel shows were. Uh, and, but it's only now that people even have to ask that question. Um, because until the 50s, at least, they were a prominent form of American entertainment, and we can still see them in reruns of Amos and Andy. But minstrel shows consisted originally in the 1830s and 40s of white men who blackened their faces with burnt cork, uh, wore wigs, exaggerated their facial features with lurid makeup, and told racist jokes and sang racist songs. This was actually probably the most important form of American entertainment in the 19th century. Uh, and it is something that we can only, with retrospect, d deplore uh, and cringe when we even, you know, hear references to it. And yet it was also sort of a, the fertile seedbed of so much that we think of, the, of the, as American culture today. Out of that came vaudeville. One can also say that out of that came music, that came ragtime, jazz, and even rock and roll. In many ways, rock and roll was simply minstrelsy updated. One of the reasons that I first became interested in Stephen Foster is that I began my uh, career in journalism uh, as a rock critic and writer. I covered Rolling Stone, I wrote for Rolling Stone, covered Woodstock. And one of the things that fascinated me about popular music from the beginning, from rock and roll, is that when did it first become cool for white teenagers to pretend they were black? 
Now, obviously, this is an important part of popular music, from Elvis Presley wiggling his hips and singing That's All Right Mama in uh, emulation of Arthur Big Boy Crudup to uh, Beck singing Got Two Turntables and a Microphone. Uh, but it goes so much further back. I mean, it goes back to the 1930s and the nice Jewish boys like Benny Goodman in the Austin Hill section of Chicago who fell in love with Louis Armstrong and began to play jazz and then be you know, became swing musicians. And it goes back even further than the turn of the century sons uh, of immigrants such as Irving Berlin and George Gershwin, who idolized Stephen Foster, by the way, uh, and uh, who, who wrote songs in black idioms. It, it goes all the way back to minstrelsy, which was when, as, as, at the very beginnings of American popular culture, white musicians and performers uh, began to imitate and rip off <laughs> uh, black styles of song and dance. And that really is at the very beginning of our popular culture, uh, which is, on the one hand, uh, a creation of exploitation uh, and of racist ripoff, but also contains a, a form of admiration and synthesis that's more profound. I mean, uh, it can't be, I would never dismiss all of rock and roll. I would certainly not dismiss all of Stephen Foster. I would not dismiss George Gershwin. You quote um, Frederick Douglass in here, and he says, uh, Frederick Douglass gave Uncle Ned, one of Stephen Foster's early songs, his stamp of approval. It would seem almost absurd to say it, he told the Rochester, New York Ladies Anti-Slavery Society in 1855, considering the use that has been made of them, that we have allies in the Ethiopian songs. Lucy Neal, Old Kentucky Home, and Uncle Ned can make the heart sad as well as merry and can call forth a tear as well as a smile. They awaken the sympathies for the slave in which anti-slavery principles take root and flourish. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, and of course, it's interesting here is Frederick Douglass, the great escaped slave and abolitionist leader, saying this, but it has more than a kernel of truth. Let's talk about My Old Kentucky Home. Today, we think of My Old Kentucky Home as sort of a celebration of cavaliers and ladies in crinoline and life on the old plantation. Uh, and yet, it was inspired by Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a great abolitionist novel. And the song was originally in Stephen Foster's notebook. The, the chorus went, uh, Poor Tom, Good Night. And the reason why is that the, when it says that, you know, that there's no more singing and, and, and uh, the children have to go, and originally it was the darkies have to go, it was because Uncle Tom was being sold down the river to uh, where he would eventually uh, end up in the hands of uh, Simon Legree. So that this song, which we think of as celebrating the life on the plantation, was really about the, the you know, selling out of a, of a black and the destruction of the black family. Um, and, and it becomes more moving when you think about it in, 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 in that light. And it's ironic, of course, today, the, the very words Uncle Tom are meant as an insult. Um, and yet, uh, Uncle Tom in Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel was a young, virile man, not a stooped, cringing, uh, you know, servile, uh, elderly guy uh, that, that we now you know, is in, you know, in our imagination. Uh, and that same note you say here earlier in the book, page 14, although my old Kentucky home, good night, is that the same as yes, Sunshine's yes. Down on My Own Kentucky Home? Was inspired by an abolitionist novel and expresses deep sympathy for enslaved African Americans, a sympathy that Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois shared, saluted. Two African Americans threatened to quit the Yale Glee Club if it sang the song at a 1996 concert. The group's president burned a copy of the song, a majority voted not to perform it, and the program was changed. And then you liken mm -hmm. it to the, the uh, opinions about Huckleberry Finn today. Yes, yes. I, mean, I think that one of the problems with American culture is that many of the great products of American culture are deeply and inevitably uh, tainted by the racism of their time. But that's like saying we're not going to teach American history <laughs> or appreciate it. I mean, to me, what is glorious about a, a, a American history and culture is that as racist as it is, um, it is also continually full of instances where that racism is overcome. And so that we can listen, I think our reactions to Stephen Foster songs today are always, there's a push-pull. On the one hand, we're, a little, we're embarrassed because of the racist words or the black dialect, and we're also embarrassed by the outright sentimentality in an era that is that we pride ourselves on our irony and our cool and our sophistication. Um, but on the other hand, for all that embarrassment, we still have that real pull to those melodies, which are part, so deeply a part of American identity and culture that, I mean, they're, they're our birthright. Um, 
And so always in the book, and as I think about Stephen Foster, you're always saying, yes, but, or both and, or on the other hand, because the songs, over, even as they are very much a part of their period uh, and partake of many of the sins of their period, and for that matter of ours, because I don't think we can pride ourselves on having overcome an, uh, ills such as racism in American society, even as they partake of those problems, they also transcend them. What is a fair way to view using 1990s or early 21st century attitudes to view songs like this and, and this minstrel show and things that took well, place? Well, like I think that. that one has to understand, first of all, the context of the time. Um, and what did they mean at that time? It's interesting, for instance, that Foster, although he began his early songs, did use ra racial epithets and the N-word, um, that gradually he dropped all of that. And so that really there's no, there's no black dialect, for instance, uh, in My Old Kentucky Home, nor is there in Old Black Joe. He, and, or in a, one of his most famous songs at the time was Nellie was a, was a Lady, Last Night She Died, Toll the Bell for Lovely Nell, My Dark Virginia Bride. No white American songwriter had ever called a black woman a lady before. And so he, even as he came out of a tradition which ridiculed African Americans, in that tradition he sort of cleaned it up. He himself said that I can't stand the trashy lyrics of many minstrel songs. What he tried to do was to ennoble and elevate the genre and to invest African Americans with much more dignity and sympathy than they ever received before. Judged in that light, those songs, I mean, to this day, I think are an accomplishment. Now, there's also Oh, Susanna. Mm -hmm. Was that an earlier song of his? Oh, Susanna was the first of his songs that became a hit, and, of course, it became a huge hit. And, and it, it swept the globe. Uh, and, and in many ways, I think that September 11th, 1847, which was the time it was first performed publicly in an ice cream parlor in Pittsburgh, is the date of the birth date of American popular music as we recognize it to this day. I want to read the first verse, which everybody knows, which is, I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. I is gone to Louisiana, my true love for to see. It rained all night the day I left. The weather, it was dry. The sun, so hot, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. And you're right about that. <clears throat> the comic contradictions that conclude the first verse of O Susanna have beguiled nearly every commentator into praising and at the same time affectionately dismissing the song as Uncle Tom foolery, a glorious bit of nonsense, etc. But O Susanna is far more ambitious and unsettling that as the second verse begins to make clear, which is, I jumped aboard the telegraph and traveled down the river, the electric fluid magnified and killed 500 nigga. Where did you find that verse and what did you think when you first read it? I was absolutely shocked. Uh, here we think of O Susanna as this harmless song and here is this disgusting use of racial epithets and making light, you know, of the casual slaughter of African Americans. I was appalled. Well, it's in the sheet music of the time. It was printed unembarrassedly. This was not something that, I mean, this was, this was the way the music was. But there are a number of elements in the song that make it more interesting than simply a racial insult. To start with, it begins, I've come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. And a, a banjo was an African-American instrument. Actually, it was an, originally an African uh, uh, instrument a gourd with four strings to which a fifth was added in America that slaves brought over with them uh, during uh, you know, the horrible Middle Passage. But he comes with a banjo on his knee as if he were a parody of a European troubadour uh, in, 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 in Provençal, France. So right there you're sort of combining African American and European imagery. Also, the beat of O Susanna is a polka from Prague. The polka was the new dance step, the twist of its era, if you will, or the frug, and it had just come um, from Prague via Paris. So here again, you're combining European and African-American musical references and idioms in a way to create something that is new. Like I would argue later on, jazz and rock and roll, which combined African, -Amer or African uh, and American European elements. So a lot is happening in the song. And then I began to think about the horror of this, you know, slaughter. And what was that really about? Well, the steam, but uh, it's, it's, what it really is about is about technology and, and modern life. Um, the telegraph, I jumped aboard the telegraph. 
uh, was the name of one of the fastest boats on the Ohio River. It used to uh, uh, set speed records going from Louisville and Cincinnati to Pittsburgh. Um, but of course also it's the telegraph which was a new invention at that point, the wires that were carrying news from the Mexican-American War. And then it goes on the bull giant burst and that's a locomotive and what happens is the electric m fluid magnified. What is happening in here is that the telegraph, the locomotive, and the steam engine, are, uh, the, uh, the steam boat, are all becoming confused. It's like a modern transportation communication. And, and then they, and they all explode. Um, and indeed, in those days, there were many train wrecks, steamboat explosions. Uh, the, the electricity of the telegraph was a mysterious, threatening, nobody really knew quite what it was. And the people who die, African Americans, are people who were living a rural life, in a pastoral society, an agricultural society. All of this was being destroyed. And the same anxiety, without the N-word, without the racial epithets, is expressed in Thoreau, Melville, and the great writers of the time. So that at the same time, not to condone any of the racism in that lyric, there is something more serious at afoot and at work in it at the same time. He was born on the 4th of July? Yes, the 4th of July, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the United States, the same, the same day that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died. And what a tremendous symbol that is of the passing of one era and the beginning of a new, because that was the end of the federal era. The last of the greats of the Revolutionary War had died, and essentially um, uh, Stephen Foster was born into the rough and tumble democracy of Jacksonian America. As a matter of fact, his father was very much an Andrew Jackson man, and at one point he was, uh, uh, ma uh, he was in Harrisburg. He was in the state senate here. Uh, and, As a uh, federalist. Uh, at that point, but he was becoming, at that point, political parties had not entirely formed the way we recognize them today, and he was already becoming a Jacksonian. And then later, he was mayor of Allegheny City which was across the river from Pittsburgh and had not yet become incorporated into Pittsburgh. Um, so he was very much a, a, a part of Jacksonian democracy. And of course, Jackson's America uh, was the where you talked about the common man and democracy, unlike the sort of the more elitist society of the revolutionary period, was the period of popular culture. Um, so that Foster really was born on the cusp um, of these two eras. There's another uh, uh, Harrisburg uh, uh, angle to the family. Not only did uh, um, uh, Stephen Foster's father serve in the legislature here, but um, when Stephen Foster uh, was a young boy, his half-brother was living in Tawanda. And uh, he said to the family in Pittsburgh, because they at this point were falling down on their fortune and really were, were rather poor, said, let me take my half-brother Stephen and I'll educate him up in Tawanda and at a or actually just north of Tawanda, where I'll be living in, in, in Tioga, uh, in the Tioga Academy. So they took a two-horse sleigh all the way from, from this was in the winter, uh, from Pittsburgh through Harrisburg, where they stopped for the night, visited the governor and the legislature, and saw a concert, and then went on to uh, Tioga. He was also related by marriage to President James Buchanan. Yes, what happened is that the oldest, Stephen Foster's oldest surviving sister, married the younger brother of James Buchanan, who was a rather impoverished minister, and whom James Buchanan never liked very much. <laughs> but uh, so at least he was linked uh, tangentially to a, to, to a person who would become president. And indeed, when Buchanan ran for president, Stephen Foster, as a young man, was the music director of the Allegheny County Buchanan Club, and they would go through the streets singing songs in favor of, uh, of Buchanan. Now, they couldn't have done very well because although Buchanan carried the state of Pennsylvania, he lost Allegheny County to uh, John Fremont, the Repub his Republican uh, uh, opponent. Did they ever meet? Buchanan and Stephen Foster, it's not known for a fact. Well, act no, I, I, it's unknown. What kind of a family was he born into? You mentioned his father and his mm -hmm. mother, but what was the family like? Uh, the family started out very well. Uh, when Stephen Foster was born, uh, William Barclay Foster was uh, on the fringes of what passed for the aristocracy of Pittsburgh. He had developed Lawrenceville uh, and named it uh, this a section of now of Pittsburgh. 
named after James Lawrence, the man in the 18, War of 1812 who said, don't give up the ship. Uh, however, he very quickly fell into debt and sort of doomed his life to a, uh, his, his family uh, have to a, a life picture of, of his parents on yes, the screen right now. of a downward social mobility at a time when most people in America were doing quite well, thank you. They, you know, America was taking off and uh, William Barclay family was uh, William Barclay Foster was sort of taking his family down the tubes. Um, his wife was resentful of this. Uh, Stephen Foster's father also uh, drank quite heavily. Um, and this became a problem, although eventually he signed the teetotaling pledge and became a leader of the temperance movement in western Pennsylvania. Although I think that Stephen as a boy was probably em embarrassed by his father addressing crowds of hundreds of people and saying, I am a drunkard, uh, confessing to people. That was probably just as, almost as embarrassing to uh, uh, young Stephen as, as uh, it was when he earlier years came home drunk. Tell me about his mother. His mother uh, came from uh, uh, Maryland originally, from a slaveholding, uh, prosperous family. Um, but her mother died when young, her father remarried, and she was raised in, partly in Philadelphia um, by aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh, indeed, uh, they were related to Oliver Evans, who is the famous inventor of the American steam engine uh, and a titan of the early American industrialism. Uh, so. And so she met William Barclay Foster when he was on a business trip, and he took her from, from uh, uh, Philadelphia via Chambersburg, where they married, uh, to Pittsburgh, where they settled and, and, and lived most of their life. They did do a little traveling around Pennsylvania, and occasionally, um, for mainly because they'd run out of money, uh, ended up for brief periods of time with, with family and relations uh, in the uh, Youngstown, Ohio area. What kind of impact did his mother have on Stephen Foster? Stephen was very close to his mother. I think that he resented his father tremendously. And his father was sort of a slap on the back uh, braggart who was always had a, you know, a great business deal was in the offing, but was never quite going to make it. He was always suing people over business deals that had gone sour as opposed to trying to make any money for the future. And I think that uh, he, Stephen, uh, was very... Um, frustrated and exasperated and resentful of his father. I mean, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I think he became a songwriter. He was turned off by the world of business and politics that was embodied by his failure of a father. Uh, and so what could be more distant from, uh, song, from, from politics uh, and business than writing songs? He was very close to his mother. His mother was a very embittered woman, I believe. Uh, uh, because of the circumstances to which her husband had reduced her and very attached to her children. And uh, so Stephen, I believe, was, he was encouraged as a child in his music. Um, nobody, and his father too, was sort of in, uh, surprised and said that, you know, Stephen has a strange talent for music. Um, but it was not as if they ever said, don't you do that music, you know, uh, straighten up and fly right and get yourself a regular job. Um, he was indulged uh, and allowed to develop uh, his talent. The problem is, in those days, when he decided to become a, uh, decided to become a professional uh, full-time songwriter, the profession did not exist. Um, popular music was in, in its infancy. It was as audacious as if he'd said, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and it's a little bit like when, I mean, he was sort of like a, a, not a prophet without uh, honor in his own land, but a prophet before his time because he saw the possibilities of popular music. But popular music hadn't yet developed the economic infrastructure that would allow somebody to make a living from it. It's a little bit like four or five years ago, not so much true now, but when everybody was getting involved in the Internet as a new medium, but nobody knew how to make any money out of it yet, in the same way, Foster understood the importance of popular music, and, and, and that it was, but it was still in its infancy. And so uh, he was a real pioneer. But uh, the failure economically of his own life was because the, the, the industry had not yet become Tin Pan Alley, uh, had not yet become a business where you could really support yourself uh, for writing songs full time. Other songwriters also taught music. Or they were went on the road like a rock group today, you know, promoting their album. And of course, there were no records or radio then. The only thing they could do was to write and publish sheet music, which was distributed in homes. 
Who distributed it? How'd the business work? Uh, well, what happened is you had a publisher, and in those days there were a lot of publishers around the country. Wherever you could have a printing press, you could have a publisher, and it was only gradually during this lifetime that the, that the business became more centralized in New York. But you could buy sheet music uh, primarily at music stores, um, and uh, you could also, for instance, you might go to a concert. And just as today, you might go to a rock concert and you could buy a sing-along book or, or a T-shirt with your favorite rock group's logo on it, you might pick up a, uh, some sheet music there or a little book they would call a songster, which might be Christie's Minstrel's favorite songs or something like that. Did a lot of people play piano? You talk about the parlor in your book, about the room of the yes, house, the parlor, yes. and the parlor piano. Yes, well, that was a very important part. Remember, this was before radio. People had to make their own music. <laughs> And so musical literacy, be it singing, playing the guitar, um, and especially playing the piano, playing the flute, was much more prevalent because you had to make your own music. Uh, and there was a revolution in, 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 in American domestic architecture in the beginnings of the 19th century that still affect us. And that part of that is the parlor. Now, rich people didn't have parlors. They had drawing rooms, <laughs> but in a regular middle-class house, nobody had a drawing room. Houses weren't big enough. What you did have, however, was in the front of the, of the house, you had what we still recognize as the parlor. And in some ways, you could say it was the false front because all the dirty work of life, you know, happened further back in the house or out back in the garage. But the parlor became sort of the domain, especially of the woman of the house and the, and the daughters of the house. This was also a time as America, be, you know, thanks to the Industrial Revolution and to uh, <clears throat> a rising fortunes in America, suddenly women weren't working all the time. Women actually had a leisure time, and they spent their leisure time in the parlor, playing the piano, looking at new sheet music, and uh, being genteel. Um, so Stephen Foster wrote parlor ballads, such as I Dream of Jeannie with a Light Brown Hair, uh, Beautiful Dreamer, uh, for one segment of the audience, which we might call the, the, the women in the parlor, while at the same time he wrote more raucous, um, less respectable, more rowdy uh, blackface songs like the Camptown Races sing the song Duda Duda for a more masculine audience that might be more apt to hear the music and sing it at a minstrel show than to perform it in the parlor. I want to ask you about copyright law at the time yeah. because you you have a story here about he entered a songwriting contest at, uh, what was the ice cream parlor? Andrews, the Eagle Ice Cream Saloon. Ice cream was a, was a, was a, a great part of America and uh, a, a wonderful, I mean, long before Ben and Jerry's. I mean, this was, uh, you, you went to have ice cream. Especially, they had, if you, uh, 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 women could go there and because they were serving ice cream as opposed to alcohol, uh, the atmosphere was a little more morally uplifting. But there was a contest in Pittsburgh. Um, and this contest was going to award a silver cup to the composer of the best new blackface minstrel song. Now at that time, Stephen Foster had moved to Cincinnati where he's working as a bookkeeper, right on the banks of the Ohio River, right where uh, Pete Rose Way is now, or three, and, and, and the stadium. Um, <clears throat> but his brother was still living in Pittsburgh, Morrison, and entered one of his songs into this contest. It was a song called Way Down South. Um, not one of Stephen Foster's best songs, but at this point Stephen Foster was an unknown bookkeeper. None of these songs, the blackface songs, had been published. And uh, Stephen Foster's song lost the contest. And a Morrison Foster, who was Stephen's brother, was convinced that the contest was rigged because by some coincidence, the winner of the contest was a member of the troupe of musicians and singers at the ice cream parlor who performed all the songs. The next day, Morrison went, saw the members of this troupe trying to copyright the song by Stephen Foster as their own. And since he was a good friend of the judge, he was able to prevent that. Because in order to copyright, that, that this even exists today, you have to have a signed copy of it that is registered with, with, with a judge. Um, but there was not a great deal of copyright protection or enforcement in those days. Also, there was nothing like BMI or ASCAP. There were no performing rights. So that you could write a song and uh, <clears throat> every minstrel group 
could, in the, across the country could sing it, or they could even turn it into a musical play, and you would get no uh, royalties for that. You only got royalties on the sale of the sheet music that you had copyrighted. But especially since there was no centralized enforcement mechanism, and there were little publishers in every, you know, in every even me, mid, middle-sized city, it was impossible to enforce. Stephen Foster's O Susanna, which he probably never made a single cent from, uh, came out in like 25 different editions immediately, um, and he didn't get any money for any of that. You, you talk in the book about at different times uh, other people would use his melodies and put their own words to it, and he would use other people's words and put them to his melodies. So there was a lot of... Well, a little bit. There, there's like a that. slight there's slight difference there. Sometimes he would set other people's poems to music. Although it must be said, I mean, after all, that's not unlike many of the, you know, Rogers and Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein. Um, although it should be said that almost all of Foster's famous songs, he wrote the lyrics as well as the music. And in that way, he's really quite singular. It's sort of like Cole Porter, you might say, or Hoagy Carmichael. Because when you stop to think of so many of America's greatest songwriters, the lyrics and the melodies were written by two different people. Um, and that's somewhat different, that process, which is just part of the normal creative process. After all, Schubert didn't write his own lyrics. <laughs> um, that's very different from the ways that his songs were sort of appropriated. For instance, when the 49ers went west on the, on the California Gold Rush, they would take the melody of O Susanna and sing new w words to it that were appropriate to what was happening in the Gold Rush. Or abolitionists would take the words, O oh, Susanna, and one of them said, uh, went, O oh, rum seller, O oh, do not sell to me. And this became a protest song against alcohol. It became a prohibition song. Of course, that was particularly ironic given the fact that uh, Stephen's father uh, had had a drinking problem and Stephen would develop and eventually die of, of alcohol-related problems himself. Now, uh, how famous did he get? At what point? At some point, how many people, just random people chosen down the street, would know who he was? They wouldn't know him. They would know his songs. Um, this was before the cult of celebrity, and after all, he didn't perform them. It was like, you know, what can I say? Almost like, you know, how many people know who is, uh, is it Diane Warns, who I think has written about half the top-selling songs of the last 10 years, sung by Celine Dion and everybody else. Um, but everybody would know... Um, and also, he didn't always put his name on the songs. Um, some, some, some were published anonymously, and sometimes he sold, especially in the case of uh, Old Folks at Home or Swanee Down the River, he sold to E.P. Christie, the leader of the minstrel band, the right to put his name on it. So he himself was never, and especially because he was a shy person as well, was not personally famous. But, but Old Folks at Home, and O Susanna became international hits. If you stop to think about it, really, America's, it was America's first great cultural export was pop music. This is before the movies, before jazz, before the Broadway show, before the other things that have Americanized the globe. The very first was music. And these were international hits in a way that we can't conceive of. of I mean, people would write that they had heard it in China that they'd heard it in the ruins of, 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 of Beirut. I mean, this was extraordinary at that time. That it, it swept the globe much like, uh, even more effectively than the Communist Manifesto, which came out the same year. How much money did he make? Well, he made nothing on O Susanna. But then he got smart and realized, if other people are making money, maybe I can actually do this for a living instead of working in the family business or becoming a bookkeeper or doing any of the kind of the drudgery that's expected of me. So he negotiated contracts with two publishers, one in New York, one in Baltimore, and they gave him what for the time was a very generous royalty, 8% and then later 10% of the face value for which the, their, the song sung, uh, sold in sheet music form. And they usually sold for 25 cents. Um, it's estimated that he made about $15,000 a year. Now, of course, that was a lot more money then than it is now. <laughs> you could almost get by on it. But it wasn't enough, and especially because after the first five or six years, it became harder and harder for him. He wanted to stop writing blackface songs. He wanted to write more respectable songs, uh, more genteel songs. 
But the parlor ballads he wrote, even though we remember some of them very fondly today, um, like perhaps Gentle Annie, uh, and certainly uh, um, I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, were not as successful as the blackface songs. And then came the Civil War. Um, and he, Stephen Foster never, you know, marched to a martial beat. Uh, the Civil War made it very hard to sing songs, uh, to, to compose songs about happy life down on the plantation. Um, and it tore him apart. By that point, he was drinking heavily. His marriage was crumbling. It's hard to say whether he, his, his songwriting deteriorated because he was drinking or he was drinking because the songwriting was deteriorated. Which came first, the, the chicken or the egg? He was caught in a, in a vicious cycle there. And also, popular music, after all, think of all the people who enjoy stardom for five years or ten years and then you never hear from them again. It's extremely hard to sustain popularity. Uh, in, 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 in pop culture. And so gradually um, his star waned so that by the time of his death in 1864 in New York in the Bowery, um, few people knew of him. Uh, he was very obscure, but everybody still knew, oh yes, old folks at home. Oh yes, oh Susanna. Oh really, he wrote those? You know, that would be the response. Mm -hmm. You talk about, uh, I guess, primarily his later songs, but you say most of the females in his songs are distant, dreaming, dead, or under the age of legal consent. Why do you think that is? Well, it, it's partly the, the, the era. I mean, after all, think of Edgar Allan Poe, who once wrote that the most beautiful subject in the world is a dead woman. <laughs> uh, it was part of the Victorian era um, uh, with that sort of celebrated in this really mawkish way uh, Mark Twain parodied this in, 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 in Huck Finn in, 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 in one of his chapters there. Um, this sort of mawkish uh, lament for the dead girl, um, this terribly morose sentimentality. I think that Foster, however, infused this with something more powerful, partly because his oldest sister, who was extremely musical and played the harp and the piano and sang beautifully died when he was young. I think that had a very, very powerful effect. One way to illustrate this is the song, O Susanna. We'll talk about another verse of O Susanna, which, other, which we do sing today. I had a dream the other night when everything was still. I thought I saw Susanna a coming down the hill. Susanna was Charlotte Foster's middle name, and it's almost as if Charlotte is coming back from the grave. And by becoming a musician and by, uh, by, by becoming a songwriter, there are many ways in which Stephen Foster was trying to resurrect his dead sister. Um, and I think that so it, I, you see that in some of the songs. And some is, is surprising in the, in the rough draft of I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. It was called I Dream of Jenny with the Light Brown Hair. Jenny was the nickname of his wife, whose maiden name had been Jane Denny McDowell, Jane Denny, a lie back, you get Jenny. At that point, Stephen and his wife were separated. And uh, in the first verses in the manuscript, it says, Jenny is dead. You know, her form lies low. She's dead in the grave. And he writes it with an odd kind of handwriting, unlike any other of his manuscripts, with these sharp, almost dagger-like downstrokes. So it's almost like, I dream a genie. It's almost as if he's trying to kill her. And then, almost perhaps in guilt or whatever, uh, at what he's tried to do, then he dreams of being reunited with her, and she's alive, and the, and the verse changes, so it becomes more romantic. And indeed, in real life, they were subsequently, briefly uh, reunited. You write in here about um, <clears throat> the fact that their only child was born just shy of nine months after their wedding day, and you found... Um, in his sketchbook, some calculations to figure out the date. And you say, uh, did Foster want to reassure himself that their child was conceived legitimately or that she was his? The numbers suggest that Marion was conceived on, their parents, on her parents' wedding night and leave a lingering, creepy suspicion that they might never have had sex again. What gives you that impression? Well, a number of things. First of all, their marriage was short. It was unhappy. It's very unclear what Stephen saw in Jane and even unclearer what Jane saw in Stephen. Uh, Jane was not especially musical. 
Um, like any young woman, she wanted to be supported, and certainly uh, somebody's going off to become a professional songwriter, a profession that doesn't even exist, is not a very safe bet <laughs> if you're looking for any creature comforts in your life. But also, if you think of Stephen Foster's music, there's, I mean, he was not a swaggering heterosexual. Um, there's something almost pre-sexual about most of his music. It's very sentimental, but you really very seldom get a spark of what we think of as genuine sexual passion. Um, I think that the experiences of his childhood, uh, the way he lost his home, I mean, almost in infancy, the way he lost his sister, uh, sort of uh, traumatized him and, and, and arrested his development in a way that he never really quite graduated to full-fledged adult heterosexuality uh, as, as we think of it. And uh, it, it is as if there was this coldness between the two of them that they never really hit off any sparks sexually. And indeed, it's unclear that Stephen ever really hit off any sparks with anyone um, uh, in an adult sexual way, be it male or female. There's long been a rumor uh, in some circles that, that Stephen Foster may have been gay. Uh, and indeed, occasionally when I was writing the book, I would get calls from people saying, is it true, or I've heard this, or I'm trying to do something about American homosexual composers. And I would say, believe me, if he were, I wish he were gay, I'm sure it would sell more copies of the book, and it wouldn't bother me, you know. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, guilty of homophobia in this, but there's no evidence of that. I think that he never really graduated to just a full, as I said, a full-fledged adult sexuality. And what role that had in the breakup of their marriage is hard to tell. After Stephen's death, um, at the, he was only 34, well, I'm sorry, 36, I'm sorry, at the age of, in, in 1864, um, his older brother burned many of his letters. And it's almost as if he was trying to cover up some stuff. He didn't want it, Stephen's alcoholism or the dissipated circumstances of his last years to become public. But also it was sort of like he wanted to expunge any record of what was going on between Stephen and uh, Jane uh, in their on-again on again relationship, um, and which did, as I said, produce only one child born nine months almost to the day after. And, 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 and after that, there's no word of, of any... Uh, even miscarriages or, or uh, anything. So I, I think that they had a, they did not have a warm relationship. Did the fact that so many of his letters were burned after his death make it hard to write this book? Oh, it made it very challenging. <laughs> um, it's ironic that in some ways the lives of his siblings and parents are better known because the brother, Morrison, kept all their letters. Uh, and but but Stevens didn't. So there's a lot of triangulation involved in trying to work with his manuscripts, work with the songs themselves, work with the letters. But there were there were gaps that uh, as much research as I was able to do, I was never able able to uh, uh, fill. I mean, one of them is the marriage. I mean, there are references at some time to some horrible thing that Jane did. Nobody can figure out what it was. Not even at the time, as a matter of fact, could some of her own relatives figure out what it was. Um, so there are blanks. Uh, but I think what I tried to do in the book, uh, and, I, and this is why I succeeded, is there may be blanks, but there are also, I think I've got the warts, <laughs> which is to say that I, it is easy on the one hand either to dismiss Stephen Foster and everything from that period is just embarrassing racism that we should just, you know, get behind us. Uh, and on the other hand, there's the idea that sort of sentimentalizing him as this, this wonderful folk poet who gave voice to America. And I don't think we can dismiss Stephen Foster. I don't think you can sort of sweep him under the rug of, of uh, political correctness. I think that in order to understand American culture and the problem we still have today, we have to look at our, the products of our culture squarely in the face. And that means looking at Foster and how, among other things, he could express great sympathy for slaves but not be an abolitionist. It was sort of like talk, and, talk is cheap. He was from a Democratic family. He was very much anti-Lincoln. Um, and after all, he made his living writing songs about, about, the, about slaves, even as he was lamenting their enslavement. So we can't sentimentalize it that way. But I think it also shows us something about our own character, is that, you know, Americans tend to be, uh, tend to have great, a great amount of sympathy in, uh, for, the, for the downtrodden, but have a great trouble in translating that sympathy into real action. <laughs> um, so 
I tried, as I said, to, to come up with a Stephen Foster who is as full of weaknesses and strengths and contradictions as I believe America is. You referred to him losing his home as a, as a child, and that is a theme that comes up a couple times in the book, uh, almost haunting him, mm -hmm. and that's the White Cottage. What was the yeah. White Cottage? Where well, the White it? Cottage was this lovely home, I mean, in a state, practically, by the standards of, of what was then frontier Pittsburgh, after all. Uh, and this was the house that Stephen Foster's father built in the middle of the suburban development that he himself had created and, and, and founded, Lawrenceville. But already by the time of Stephen Foster's birth, he was falling behind in his mortgage payments. Uh, within two years, he was kicked out of the house. And after that, he was sort of shunted around from rentals to living with relatives, and the family began its, its spiral of downward mobility. But you think of all the, the, the his songs that are, you know, my old Kentucky home, which is no more. Uh, the old folks at home, and he's an exile wandering and missing the old folks at home. All, so many of his songs have this deep nostalgia for a lost home. Now, in his case, he really had a lost home. But this is one of the reasons why his songs, I think, still resonated and certainly did at the time with Americans, because most Americans had left their homes. They left their homes in Europe to come to America. They left their homes in Africa and been, you know, and been dragged across uh, during the Middle Passage. Or they left their homes in the East across the Alleghenies to go west. Or they left their homes on you know, in the Midwest to go to, 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 go to uh, the California gold rush. And all of America was missing their home as America was being settled in the westward movement. And so Stephen's personal feeling of exile, because he never went west, he stayed most of his life, you know, in Pittsburgh. But nonetheless, his personal sense of exile uh, and homelessness spoke to Americans' greater sense of uh, homelessness. Did you listen to a lot of recordings of his songs for this book? Oh, yes, yes, many. Um, it's funny, they're not, it's, there, are, there are very few definitive recordings anymore. Uh, people are, for understandable reasons, very reluctant to record the blackface song. All of them, you know, how do you sing song? This is something that everybody has to work with. How do you sing the first line of My Old Kentucky Home? You know, or to summer, the darkies are gay. I mean, of course, now you have not only the problem with the word darky, understandably, but also with what gay means in, in common parlance. And so the blackface songs present a real challenge because you have to change the words um, to make them acceptable, and they should be changed. Um, <clears throat> Why should they be changed? But that creates a problem. Well, I think that unless you are performing, and I have, I've had a friendly discussions and arguments uh, with, with several members, friends of mine who are performing artists, I think it is unfair to sing a song that uses racist words unless you very carefully prepare the audience and say, okay, now I want to tell you something. I'm going to sing a song. It uses these words. And I'm doing this because I want people to understand what the era was like. In other words, you've got to prepare people. The same thing you would do with a television program. If you were going to run a television program that had explicit sex or things that might be you know, explicit violence or I'm not necessarily advocating the television rating system as it now exists, but I do think it's responsible to warn people about the content of an upcoming show. Uh, and so I, I do think that you know, it's unfair to expose people to what can be you know, deeply racially traumatic without preparation. But there are other songs of Stephen Foster's that have become extremely popular only recently that do not use uh, racial words. And one of the example is Hard Times Come Again No More. In the last 10 years, that has been recorded by Bob Dylan, Emmy Lou Harris, the McGarrigal Sisters, the opera baritone Thomas Hampson. It was the sung at the beginning and the end of the film Georgia, starring Jennifer Jason Lee. It Fred Clay Ramblers did it. Yes, yes, you're right. And I think it, they were one of the first, as a matter of fact. And this is a song which was not one of Stephen Foster's big hits. And, uh, uh, and yet in the, in, the, in the 90s, I mean, it has become almost a standard part of, of, of many people's repertoire. So we're always rediscovering Foster in, in different ways. By the way, of all the recordings of Hard Times Come Again No More, I think by far the best is one by a woman named Sid Straw, S-T-R-A-W. And it's a beautiful arrangement on which Ry Cooter plays the guitar. And it's arranged by Van Dyke Parks, who used to work with the Beach Boys. 
And it's a beautiful, beautiful version on a, what a now is a relatively hard to get album that came out about six years ago. Is there a recording of Stephen Foster songs that you can recommend? Uh, well, there are several. I recommend the, 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 uh, uh, the CD uh, by my friend, the baritone Thomas Hampson. Um, those are more because he is an operatic baritone, are, are more um, operatic in, in their way. I mean, they're, they're with, with actually is playing with Jay and Molly Unger, who were famous for Asha Khan's Farewell and the music to the Civil War uh, series by uh, Ken Burns. And I think those are very uh, lovely. Uh, renditions. Those are mostly of the parlor ballads uh, because uh, Thomas is, is reluctant especially to use the, the, the words um, to some of the blackface songs. Uh, but more than that, it's sort of catch as catch can. I've sort of made different tapes of, of favorite versions of, of, uh, uh, of, of songs. Roy Orbison, who was one of my favorite singers, uh, did a great version of Beautiful Dreamer. Um, the uh, but you really have to hunt around to find, I think, a, there is no, at this point, accepting uh, uh, Hampson's limited CD, because it doesn't represent the whole work. I regret to say that at this point, there is not a good in-print CD that gives you a broad sampling of Foster's uh, music. Could Stephen Foster sing? Uh, he was described as having sort of a robust uh, baritone. So, I mean, he could certainly sing, but he did not, he was a shy guy. He didn't really perform his songs very frequently uh, in, in, in public. Um, he was more apt to sing in the company of friends uh, than certainly on the stage. I want to ask you about the, the chapter titles of your book. I want to okay. read some of them here. Um, a Father's Fall, Death and the Maiden, The Crying Game, Out of the Mouths of Babes, Jumping Jim Crow, O Temperance, O Mores, Genuine Negro Fun, Pigeon Wing and Moonbeams, Hog Heaven, Ice Cream and the Annihilation of Time and Space. Did you have fun? Well, yes. You know, I spent, I mean, I have been, in, in life I was an, the opinion editor of, of uh, New York Newsday for five years. I was the articles editor of the New York Times Magazine for ten years. Um, I've spent my life writing headlines, among other things, and uh, I, I mean, I was so conscious of wanting to write a book that was inviting. Uh, but this book, I think, sort of straddles the, the it's, it has footnotes, and on the one hand, it's academic in that sense, but I think you'll find that it's also written with a, uh, with a popular uh, uh, pleasurability. And so I did work on those. I mean, for instance, Hog Heaven is the, is the uh, chapter about uh, Cincinnati, which in that point was the center of the pork industry uh, in the United States. Um, or uh, Pigeon Wing and Moonbeams is obviously a play on the old song uh, uh, Polka Dots and Moonbeams. Um, and so I, I hope that, the, the, I, that people would find the, uh, the, the chapter titles uh, amusing and tantalizing. Oh my God, what's that about? The book is dedicated to Ellen and Maud. Who are they? Well, uh, they are my wife and daughter, so <laughs> who had to put up with me and with Stephen Foster for uh, all those years. And uh, they were a source of occasional frustration, but uh, undying support. How hard, <clears throat> how hard did you work on the uh, notes in the back? Because they're pretty extensive. Yeah, I worked very hard. I, I, um, <clears throat> before I was a journalist and after I was a journalist, uh, for years, uh, I was a... Uh, um, uh, a, a would-be English teacher and professor. And indeed, uh, in January, I'm going to a Princeton, and I'm going to be, uh, for the spring semester, I'm going to be the Anschutz Distinguished Visiting Fellow in American Studies uh, and uh, teach a course there uh, in uh, the relationship of music to uh, literature and painting uh, in America before the Civil War. So although I don't have a Ph.D., I've always respected academe, and uh, the footnotes, which nobody has to read <laughs> unless they're seriously interested, um, are, are, are there partly to satisfy the academic in me. But also, I find that in a lot of contemporary books that do not have sources become impossible to judge. How do you know whether somebody's making something up? Or if you're interested in it. I mean, people have talked about this. There was recently a book about footnotes, and there's been much talk about the decline of the footnote. Um, I think it's the only way you can check things. Or if, say, you re you're reading a book and, oh, that's a tantalizing thing. I'd like to read more about that. Well, if there's not a footnote to know where that information came from, you're stuck. Um, 
So I, 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 I spent a lot of time on them, uh, making sure that they were accurate. Um, and with the recognition, I, first of all, I was delighted that my publisher allowed me, uh, you know, indulged me so that I could have them. But uh, you can skip them. Any reader can, but that any reader who's interested can check my sources, can explore things on his or her own, and uh, pursue his or her own interests and enthusiasms. You have a discography in the back, and somehow the Beatles White Album made it into your discography. How did it do that? Oh, well, there's a song. I mean, there's a lot of popular music in the, in the discography because there were, as Stephen Foster was the beginning of so much that we still recognize as uh, <coughs> uh, um, popular music. And uh, after his first sort of uh, rush of hits, Stephen Foster wrote a song saying, I told you about the banjo on my knee. I told you about the Camp Town races. And it reminded me of the John Lennon song where he recites, I think it's Glass Onion. Uh, I have to re uh, remind myself where he talks, refers to previous songs he's written. And it's in very much the same way. Um, there are other songs that, uh, that uh, I, I refer to because they have echoes. James Taylor, for instance, and, and Carolina on my mind. Uh, and indeed, people have then later talked to me about the fact that Stephen, that James Taylor rec has recorded O Susanna, and he did it in a way, you think about his most famous song, Fire and Rain, O Suzanne, the plans they made put an end to you. Uh, and uh, evidently, I'm told, although I don't know this personally, but I've been told that he, that song is based upon a relationship he had with a woman named Suzanne, and so that O Susanna had an extra ring uh, uh, for him. And songs like Caroline in My Mind, I think of James Taylor, for instance, who had problems with drugs, just as Stephen Foster had problems with alcohol. And uh, Taylor was in the middle of the Vietnam War and, and confused and certainly not participating in it, and an unhappy young man, identical of age to me, by the way. Um, at, in the same way, there was Stephen Foster with some of the same substance abuse problems in the Civil War and uh, equally uh, uh, miserable and, and evading in his own way the conflict. So the, there, to me, uh, whenever I, I listen to contemporary music, I'm always hearing echoes of Stephen Foster, or when I listen to Stephen Foster and think about Stephen Foster seeing him, premonitions of contemporary music. Now we only have about a minute left, uh, but I want to ask you about uh, some other project you're working on. First of all, this book came out in 1997 in hardback, yes. and it is coming out in 1998 in, in paperback. In paperback from DeCapo uh, Press and uh, should be in the stores uh, by Labor Day uh, of 1998, I'm assured. Uh, also, uh, I'm working on a, a documentary film for PBS that is being produced by WITF uh, here in Harrisburg, uh, and uh, with some generous initial support from the uh, Pennsylvania Humanities Council and the Pennsylvania Museums and Historical Commission. Uh, we've done a lot of the pre-production work and, and uh, uh, shooting, and we're going full steam ahead. So I hope that this will soon be on uh, public television for everyone to see. Do you have another book in the works? Uh, I'm suspicious about that. I'm sort of went, trying to get this film out of the way, but I'm actually interested in writing a book about the Brill Building and about American popular music in the 1950s and 60s. The Brill Building was the center of the publishing business for groups such, uh, for songwriters such as Neil Sedaka and um, uh, uh, Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil uh, and Carol King and Jerry Goffin. And I'm interested in what, the same way that Stephen Foster really is about multiculturalism in its way in the 19th century, I'm interested in multiculturalism in American popular music in the late 50s and early 60s when you had pr almost exclusively Jewish kids who were the sons and granddaughters of immigrants who developed this incredible sensitivity, not only to black music, but also to Puerto Rican music. 1957 was the height of the Puerto Rican migration to New York. And so I'm interested in trying to explore the theme of multiculturalism and think of songs like There is a Rose that Grows in Spanish Harlem and, and songs of that era. But uh, that's still a far, long way away. This is the cover of the book, Duda, Stephen Foster and the Rise of Popular Culture. The cover of the paperback will be different, I'm told? Yes. Ken Emerson, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. 
Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details. Like us on Facebook.